Yeah, so uh, the topics this time around is change data capture for a brave new world. I'm going to be going through different ways of doing change data capture from the prehistoric, like uh, stuff before the early 2000s, to stuff the, the way you probably want to do it from now on. Uh, Forward about me, I'm a co-founder of Aven, which is a database as a service uh, company. We basically serve five different public clouds and support seven different regions, have uh, different databases and uh, that we support, Postgres being one of them. Uh, on the Postgres side, I'm also the main maintainer of a couple of uh, Postgres-related open source projects. Uh, PG Horde is a backup daemon that's fairly commonly used. There's PG Lookout, which does HA things, and PG Memcache. Uh, I've been using Postgres for quite a long time. So, uh, CDC, uh, Change Data Capture. Uh, the Wikipedia uh, definition of the word uh, is, uh, or the acronym is, uh, it's a set of uh, software design patterns used to determine and track the data that has changed in a database so that action can be taken using the changed data. Uh, this is really commonly used uh, when, uh, for example, you have a a uh, data warehouse where you're actually uh, moving stuff from your online transaction processing databases, which there can be many of them. Uh, there are also lots of other use cases for those, and I'll be going through some of them during the talk. Uh, why do you actually want to go through, why do you actually want to do change data capture is that typically when you store something in a database uh, in your firm's uh, premises or in the cloud or wherever, it's usually just the beginning of its journey through the systems that your company is running. Uh, it usually doesn't end there. Uh, Real-time change in information is what we're trying to get out of this. So uh, at the moment when a change happens, we really want to get the information now so we can actually do actions based on that. Uh, I'll be going through historical models more about ETL and that sort of thing soon. Uh, the main idea about why we want to get this change data as a delta is that it's way more efficient than historical means of just taking a database dump once a day than putting it into your data warehouse. Or um, there have been multiple different ways of doing that and even optimizing that, but the new stuff is much better. Uh, Forward on a couple of examples I'll be using. Uh, I'll be using a table like this. Uh, it basically has a serial primary key. Uh, there's just one column that's actually of interest, but I'm going to be demoing uh, how people have been historically doing this, which is why I need the other columns. And then the inserts are going to be nonsensical, and the other DMLs are going to be also nonsensical, so don't really focus on that. We're just trying to get some data and to actually see the change happen. Uh, change data capture in the age of the dinosaur. So uh, on this slide, you can actually imagine a picture of dinosaurs roaming freely through an idyllic landscape. This is how it was done uh, in the days of your grandfather or something like that. Uh, and to actually remark, it's, this is stuff before the early 2000s. So Typically, when people had data warehouses back then, uh, they, uh, for example, run nightly database dumps of their actual database or multiple different databases and combine them in a nightly batch job. Uh, this is a bit of a bummer because let's say your uh, online transaction processing databases by themselves are in the terabyte range. If you actually have to actually copy all the data in those every night to a data warehouse, even if like 1% of the data has changed, you're actually be uh, transferring 99% of the data for no apparent reason. Uh, Historically, people have also been using lots of different proprietary ETL tools. I'm not going to be going into those in this talk, but uh, I'm going to be just uh, like talking about how you could actually achieve this with open source tools. Uh, just a side note, PostgreSQL's copy command actually made this a lot better because you could actually choose what data you want. I wanted only three, these three columns from this table, so you actually didn't need to grab the whole table or the whole database. So things weren't that bad. Uh, but in order to get this data, there were multiple ways of actually figuring out what has changed uh, once we went away from the actual dumps. People have been using things like uh, 
an update field, which would be a timestamp in this case. Uh, so basically, they do selects that give me everything that is uh, that hasn't been updated since yesterday. Uh, then they would update the timestamp, and off they would go. The same thing would uh, uh, could work in the sense that if you're just tracking inserts uh, on a table, and you keep track of what did you transfer yesterday? I transferred all the rows in the table up until ID five million and one, and so you could start the next day from five million and two. Uh, this sort of approach is really horrendously inefficient, but it got the job sort of done. There are multiple different variants of how people have been doing this. They had update columns which were Boolean, is that, okay, I have actually transferred this row in this format to the data warehouse, uh, which is really inefficient because every, for every read you're doing, you're actually doing a write as well, which doesn't kind of help with the performance. Uh, also, in different naive implementations, uh, typically I've seen lots of in the wild where people just tracked inserts and updates. So if actually data went missing, the data warehouse never noticed and just kept on growing. That may be fine or maybe not fine, but lots of people when they were doing their own homespun versions of this kept on hitting that sort of thing. So the way people did this, like uh, as an example of what I just mentioned, is that they did like select star from source table where ID is greater than or equal to whatever I picked yesterday. The same thing with a timestamp, which is pretty simple. So uh, in this case, you're just looking at, okay, I yesterday I basically got all the rows up until uh, date, like, Timestamp X, so now I'll just ask for all the rows that are above that. Then the third variant is this Boolean thing that I mentioned, and this is like even more horrendously inefficient because then you could at least describe the change somewhat with those other columns, or at least make it somewhat in a sort ordered form. But in this case, you're just looking at a Boolean. Has it been actually updated and moved to the data warehouse or not? And then a couple of other forms of this. Uh, uh, actually, that's a duplicate. The, the topmost, but the, uh, the, this one, the update, is that you're actually reading it and updating it with the same statement. But lots of people were using this sort of thing to actually get the data back in the day. Then uh, the advent of trigger-based approaches made this much, much better. So you started actually having triggers that updated change tables. So uh, every time you did an insert, um, another row got inserted into a change table saying this row got inserted. And eventually, um, once you actually wanted to replay that, you just went to the change table and looked at, okay, here was an insert operation at this timestamp. Uh, which did this, uh, like put these values in these columns. Uh, Sloney and Londist uh, uh, were probably the most prominent ones for doing replication or, uh, well, even uh, CDC in this way. Uh, but there were tons and tons of homespun uh, solutions that I've seen used in different firms. Uh, the good thing about this is that it allows all data, like all DML, to be run. So inserts, updates, deletes, they're all fine, uh, unlike in the naive, naive homespun versions. Uh, but the, the bummer with this sort of approach is that if you're using triggers and you're writing it, uh, the change that actually happened to a change table. Uh, you're actually doubling the amount of writes you're doing in the database. So let's say you do an insert on table A, uh, but the same insert information gets actually also inserted into a change table that gets read on later on. That's uh, horrendously inefficient uh, to actually run, and it really will tank your database performance if you actually try to do this on a large scale. And also, none of these really back then handled DDL that well. So if you actually did like create index on table, they didn't get reflected on the target end where you're actually moving the data. Or if you added a new column, maybe that didn't actually get caught up. So lots of different things uh, didn't really uh, work unless you were really careful not to break it. Uh, 
Yeah, so here's an example. This is like a pseudo example that uh, you create a trigger. Um, you just wanted to actually monitor a table for all updates and inserts and deletes, and then call a function. This function would uh, probably uh, just create a new row in some sort of a change table saying that you know, an insert happened at timestamp X and its contents were these. Um, yeah, so with the change table, you could replicate with logical replication also to other databases, even back then. So Sloney is really old. It's, uh, if you go to Sloney, one's repository, the first comment is from year 2003. So uh, there have been solutions for doing this, uh, even in Postgres world, for quite a while. But uh, <clears throat> they have been really tedious to run for one reason or another. And the advent of a new age. So uh, in Postgres 9.4, logical decoding got introduced. Uh, logical decoding uh, allows uh, basically Postgres to decode the write ahead log to actually create the changes out of that. That basically allows you to actually capture all the changes happening in your database without doing the double writes that the trigger approach had. And this is revolutionary in the sense that it comes with a very low performance uh, overhead. So this thing will make your database fly if you previously were actually using trigger-based approaches. Um, so change data capture, what is it? Um, it allows, um, with the, in conjunction with something called uh, slots, allows Postgres to keep uh, track of all the changes happening in a single logical database. So it then decodes the write ahead log to the desired output format. There are multiple different plugins that actually allow you to basically uh, write the change data in pretty much any format. There's ones for protobuf, there's ones for JSON, there's ones for pretty much anything. And you can, of course, write your own. Uh, there, this is really very performant. So uh, you probably are almost doubling your write performance compared to a triggering-based approach. So change data capture, what can it actually do? It can track all the DML again, but unfortunately it can't uh, by itself track data definition language changes. So again, if you create a new table, it'll probably not, uh, it won't catch that. There are ways that replication systems get around this by using event triggers. Uh, and an event trigger basically allows you to actually trigger on create table or that sort of DDL operations basically. And then you would do another change table uh, like in Sloney, but this is just required for the uh, uh, DDL level changes. Uh, used cases for this are really various. I mean, the, the topic of this talk is change data capture, but you could do and be using this for replication. You could be using this for auditing purposes. There are lots and lots of different use cases because this finally comes with the almost zero uh, performance impact. Well, it's not quite zero, but it's really low. Uh, logical replication connections also these days are supported by multiple different language drivers for Postgres. So to name one, the JDBC driver can actually read logical replication changes. So you can actually ask the database, can you give me what has happened uh, since the last time I asked you this question? And the same holds true for Python and some of the others. But yeah, uh, the lack of DDL support is a really annoying thing. Also, another really bad thing is that um, if you're reading this change stream from a master server, uh, and that happens to die, and let's say you even have a standby ready to take over, but even in that case, you're losing the position where were you actually reading the data from. So let's say, you, were re you had read up on all the changes that had happened until, let's say, 3 p.m., 
Uh, unfortunately, once the master goes down, the, like the standby that it gets promoted has no idea of what you've actually done previously. So there are still some operational concerns around using this sort of thing. And then another bigger bummer is that depending on the output plugin in use, they have a really limited set of data types that they actually support. So uh, tread carefully here if you're de definitely if you're using user-defined data types and, where, and using something that is way more exotic than the basic integers, floats, texts, uh, uh, whatnot. Uh, yeah, and the other thing is that let's say you're running a database that has tons of different logical databases within it. So a database cluster of let's say 100 databases Unfortunately, you'll actually need uh, to actually uh, check for a hundred different logical streams. So the logical decoding is always uh, tied to a single logical database. So in the case you're actually using tons of uh, Postgres logical databases, then you'll actually have to uh, do quite a bit of legwork to actually get the changes out of all of them. How do you set it up? It's actually pretty easy these days. So with Postgres 10, uh, you set the write ahead log level to be uh, logical. Happily, these days, and uh, the other two settings that uh, are on the slide, max replication slots and max wall senders, those actually are by default 10. So you don't actually even have to change them these days. The other thing you actually need to do is you need to have a role that actually has the replication privilege granted to it. The replication privilege allows it to create these uh, replication slots where Postgres will start keeping a track of what has it read from the database and it further on, furthermore actually will keep Postgres, uh, the write ahead log on the Postgres server side on disk until you've actually are fully done with it. So this will, the, the capability also helps uh, that Postgres will not actually get rid of your write ahead log before actually fully done with the thing. Uh, before Postgres 10 release, uh, you also needed to do changes to pghva.conf to allow uh, for a logical replication setting. But these days, uh, it's enough to actually just have access from the user account uh, from the, for the role for that particular logical database. So the setup has become a lot easier over time. Uh, one of the plugins for uh, doing uh, JSON, uh, for doing uh, logical decoding is called wall to json it's a fairly popular uh, plugin uh, it basically turns those changes into uh, simple json objects i'll be dem demoing them soon uh, there are really strict data type limitations on what it supports. Uh, the upshot of why that is is all partly because, because it's actually creating JSON out of your changes. JSON doesn't have a data type for every possible uh, data type that you can imagine in Postgres. It's fairly limited in what it can store, but it's still pretty good for lots of different use cases. Uh, but it's also supported by uh, Database as service vendors. This actually allows you to replicate your data away from different vendors if you actually need to do it. Uh, one approach uh, to doing change data capture, I'm going to be going these from the simplest to the most complex or most powerful, perhaps. Uh, the simplest one is probably running PG and receive logical. So uh, this is a command line tool uh, included in Postgres these days that um, allows you to connect to Postgres and start uh, listening for changes uh, and receiving them from the Postgres as they happen. Uh, the great advantage of this is that it's really simple to get started. It's just a single command line tool, but it has multiple downsides, as in you're actually receiving the data to a single file on a single machine. If that machine is lost, so is your change data. Uh, it's also really hard to scale this, as in because it's all again going into a single machine. Yeah, it looks like this. So, if you run a command line, 
like the one above, um, you basically give it the uh, connection uh, parameters of your database. Uh, that allows uh, it to know where to connect. Then you specify that please create me a slot because in the case of this example, one doesn't exist. The slot will basically force the Postgres to keep all the write ahead log from that point onwards um, up until we've read it at some point. So even if the tool were to go down and you would actually just kill it or something, you could just re uh, start receiving the events from wherever you stopped previously. And you define the name of the uh, slot that you're using, in this case, PGDA Parry, and then you define which uh, decoding plugin you want to use. In this case, I'm demoing wall to json so the, the stuff that wall to json actually creates is that uh, if I had an insert like I demoed here earlier, let's see, where was it? So it's, it was something like this that's being demoed now. So just a simple text insert into a table. So if we go back to uh, the example, uh, Walter Jason will write, what kind of a change was it? In this case, it was an insert into the uh, schema public into a table called source table. Uh, you can uh, basically, this could have also been either a delete or update if such a one would have happened. Then the plugin will also output what were the column names involved in the insert. So we get the full list of columns that were involved. It'll give us what were the data types involved in those columns. So I, the ID was an integer. The important data, which was the string we inserted, was text. And timestamp with time zone was the create time. Uh, also, it'll finally give you what we actually wanted, which was the column values, as in the actual change data that got inserted. In this case, uh, it inserted an ID of one, and then first bit of very important analytics data, which was the string we were inserting. So all this sort of thing comes out of the uh, plugin. But this could as well be written in, say, Avro or, say, Protobuf. It, the serialization format that is used is completely dependent on the output plugin that you're using. Another approach is to just read the changes uh, within your own application. So it is possible that you can just uh, tell Postgres that, okay, I want to receive all the logical changes that are happening in the database, and then you can actually act on them fairly easily. Uh, yeah, the downside of this is again, that it's just a single receiver for your entire database. Depending on the amount of volume that's going, that may be suboptimal and uh, something that actually becomes a bottleneck of its own because there's just a single reader. But here's, for example, a Python example of how you would actually do this and run, uh, like get a stream of changes uh, into your Python application. So you define, again, the name of the slot that you want to use, in this case, PGDA Paris. You would open up a logical replication uh, connection to Postgres. Then you would open up a logical uh, a cursor over that connection, which would allow you to create the replication slot that we uh, mentioned earlier, which was PGDA Paris. So after that point, Postgres will again start archiving all the write-ahead log so, it, uh, <clears throat> so you can actually read them at will. Then there is this uh, final command, which is start replication, which is something you can tell Postgres that, okay, I'm ready to receive uh, these changes that you're giving me. Then, uh, just to demo this, like we could insert something on the table, but the way you actually read them, there's, there's multiple helpers for this as well, but uh, a uh, log cursor read message is the method you'd be using. Uh, Zalando heavily put effort into uh, supporting psycho, uh, having PsychoPG2 support logical replication, and it works fairly well. It also, by the way, supports streaming replication, which is the physical sort, but uh, they're both rather fairly well supported in, uh, Wald uh, 
in Psycho PG2 these days. But besides Psycho PG2, you can do this even in your Java application these days. The latest version of the JDBC driver is fully capable of doing exactly the same. So if you want to actually get a stream out of the database, what has been inserted or done to it, it's fairly simple these days. Yeah, so a third approach, which is a lot more complex, is to use like a streaming platform for your data. I'm gonna be using Apache Kafka as the example. But this is basically when your needs aren't that simple. You actually want to do transformation based on the data. You actually want to change data to be securely stored so you can actually revisit it at will. Uh, the, but the downside of this sort of an approach is that it's very, very complex to do unless you're familiar with running a distributed streaming uh, platform. So before starting to look at this sort of thing, uh, I'd avoid it until I absolutely had to do it. But if you actually start doing this, then you can actually do lots of different things very easily. But the overhead of actually managing this is considerable. But this is again something that huge companies love to do. So uh, just to give you an example, uh, Netflix uh, last week mentioned that they're running 4,000 Kafka uh, servers handling a trillion messages a day. Some of these are change data capture messages, some are something else. But the volumes that companies are pushing through this sort of streaming platforms for change data capture are enormous. So there is no way you can handle those again with a single reader. They're reading it directly from the database. Of course, they have thousands of databases, so that wouldn't necessarily apply. But honestly, don't go this way until you're sure you actually need the capacity. Uh, so a word about Apache Kafka. But how many of you have heard of Apache Kafka? OK, uh, quite a few, actually. Yeah, so it's a distributed streaming platform that uh, allows you to publish content into topics and th then you can also subscribe to those topics so you actually get the changes that are happening in those in real time. It also allows you to uh, reread the data at will. So even though lots of people can use it as a message broker, unlike a conventional message broker that had inboxes per reader, the data is actually in Kafka or uh, Amazon Kinesis or Google's PubSub, only written once, but you can actually uh, read within uh, the, uh, the topic by just changing the offset of the, of the data that you're reading. So you can reread the data at will as long as the data exists in a streaming platform. Uh, there are huge installations of Apache Kafka, like I mentioned. And the data that you're actually storing into a Kafka partition is, uh, it contains a key which uh, allows you to make the um, value within it unique. So if you write two uh, messages with the same key, only the last one will get stored. Uh, it allows you to also put in a binary value. You can actually uh, freely choose as large a binary value. By default, it's up to one megabyte, but you can change the default. And then it also stores a timestamp of when your data was read. But the uh, power behind this sort of thing is that it doesn't really care what sort of data you're putting into it. It could be absolutely anything that you're storing there. It could be click streams from your website. It could be change data capture from uh, uh, Postgres. It could be something completely different. But these platforms are completely agnostic to actually what the contents are. Yeah, so all the data in both like in Kinesis and Chikovka and Google's Pubs is organized around topics. You can have as many topics as you wish and then it's further on organized into partitions which allows you to scale it so that you're writing to a thousand machines at once if you want to do that sort of thing. The data within a partition in case of Apache Kafka is guaranteed to keep order. So once you write the, let's say, Postgres inserts in a certain order. So I insert two rows in a table, and then I deleted the uh, uh, 
the last one from there, the order that you're going to be reading them back from Apache Kafka is always going to be the same. It will never change after you've written to it. Uh, the neat thing is that oh, what a firm called Confluent uh, uh, demoed a while back with a Postgres extension called Bottled Water is um, you can actually uh, have a Kafka topic that, um, for example, is identical to a table that you have. So in this case, they were writing all the data in a Postgres table so that the primary key was equal to the key in a topic. And even though if you were writing more rows to it with the same keys, it basically had the full contents of your table. This basically allowed, if you wanted to replicate a single table through a streaming data service, it made it trivial because you could actually find any given value from your table from there. Uh, if your data doesn't actually have a natural key, uh, in that case, uh, you can actually attach a retention policy to it. So keep my data for a week or keep my data for a month or keep data up to 10 gigabytes on disk. Uh, it allows also, this is the big benefit out of using something like this, is it allows you to write the data once and to read it as many times as you wish. So in the case where we're reading directly from Postgres, from a replication slot, you can only do it once. But in this case, once the data is here, you can actually read it as many times as you want because typically firms come up with new use cases for using their data. The data that they're writing is like, let's say you sell a book, you write a row into tables saying sold a book at time X, then you want to send an email uh, about what, like to the buyer of the book. And then you want to uh, notify, let's say your inventory, uh, um, guys that, okay, we need to buy more of these books so that we actually have them on stock. You don't actually need to know at the time when you're writing it to Kafka how you're going to use it in the future. You can come up with new use cases after the fact and just reread the same data again and again. Debezium is an Apache Kafka Connect, uh, connector plugin. Uh, what this means is that it allows you to read from Postgres's logical replication uh, to any change that you are making directly into Kafka. And it's trivial to set this up if you are actually running Apache Kafka. Apache Kafka uh, itself is kind of hard to run, but if you actually are already managing the complexity, this makes it trivial to actually and move over all the changes that you're doing in, in your database to Kafka. It, besides uh, Postgres, it actually supports most of the major database, so MongoDB, MySQL, Oracle, which is, well, there is support there for that is sort of there, but it could be slightly improved. Uh, but the thing is also that once you have the data in Kafka, you can also do any sort of transforms that you were doing previously with your ETL processes. And it becomes really trivial to, uh, to transform your data for even multiple times, depending on what your need uh, for it is. And Debezium actually supports as output plugins either a protobuf one or wall to json that I demoed earlier. Another way, if you have this data warehouse, big database that you actually want to move a portion of your, um, let's say, online transaction processing data every day, is actually to use built-in logical replication that's now supported with Postgres 10. So this allows you to choose a subset of the data that you want to replicate. Let's say you want to replicate only inserts done to a table X. Because previously, if you were using something like a Postgres streaming replication that was introduced with 9.0, uh, you could actually only replicate the full database cluster or nothing at all. This allows you to just transfer a single table to another database at will. This is really useful because previously, uh, like I mentioned in the age of the dinosaur, uh, people were doing full database dumps every night. But this allows you to do that in real time, easily, with built-in Postgres, without any extensions. Uh, there's also lots of other use cases this is useful for. You can, for example, uh, hopefully in the future, do a major version upgrades based on this. 
in th that case, you would be replicating the changes to another Postgres instance. Uh, with streaming replication with Postgres, that has always been version tied, as in you could only replicate from, say, 9.5 to 9.5, but you couldn't actually replicate from a 9.5 machine to a 9.6 machine. And finally, um, Sloney, like I mentioned, was created in the early 2000s. Uh, now we actually have something that, is, uh, that does the same thing in a way better fashion, really efficiently, and it's built into core. Um, yeah, like I mentioned, you can replicate a subset of your data. Uh, and again, the same limitation here applies that you if you have lots of logical database in your database cluster, uh, you need to actually set up replication for each and every one of those logical databases. Uh, there's a, a slight um, bummer, as in this requires currently, if you set it up, it requires super user. Uh, you can get around it uh, if you create security definer functions. But uh, there's a bit of a hassle if you're trying to do this without having super user privileges. Uh, Amazon Database Migration Service is another common use case people are using for this, either migrating to uh, Amazon or they uh, are actually moving stuff from, for example, if you have a database somewhere, they, you can actually put your da data into Redshift, which is their analytical data warehouse. So there's lots of people and use case for this sort of thing. And the other thing is that let's say you're um, switching between uh, vendors, you can actually also do no downtime migrations between actual uh, uh, databases as well, if you want. Uh, the way it works is that uh, you set up publications. These are basically collections of tables where you specify what sort of operations you're interested in. In the case of this example, you're just insert, uh, interested in inserts, but it could be inserts, updates, or deletes, or all of them. Then on the receiving side, you create a subscription, so hence the name pub sub. Uh, you create a subscription, and once this has been created, it will start replicating automatically from the source database to your uh, target database. And note that this is the only thing you need to do. So this is pretty much as simple as it gets. So for anyone with memories of a Sloney, this is much, much better than what we had back then. Uh, here's an example that, that um, if you want to demo this, you just insert data into the source to, uh, database into the table, and then you can read it out from the target database in semi-real time. It's fairly fast. And if we had some time left, we'd probably do a demo, but since we're a bit short on time, I'll uh, just do a short recap. So logical uh, decoding and replication are revolutionizing the way CDC can be done on Postgres. It doesn't really require database dumps or trigger-based approaches. This is the future, and it's only going to get better from here once the uh, corner cases like failovers are actually handled in the future. Uh, but anyway, if you're taking this into use, do notice that it still um, has some sharp edges around it, and uh, it may make sense to actually try it out before taking it into live production. Okay, Q&A. Uh, time to ask me anything. Any questions? No questions at all. No? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Okay.